I wake up at 5.30 in the morning, and I walk over to my electric piano, and I put on my headphones, and I, and I play jazz piano for an hour. And I for an hour? For an hour, between 5.30 and 6.30. So you're, wow, you're really, every morning? The following is a conversation with my good friend, Johnny Harris. He's an Emmy award-winning journalist who is known for his work on his YouTube channel of the same name, as well as his work with Vox and the New York Times. He's an incredible guy. This was an amazing conversation. I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. We discussed him leaving the Mormon church, the state of journalism today, identity, online criticism, and what it takes to make it. I will leave links to his work in the description below or on the show notes if you're just listening. Before we dive into this episode and this conversation, which I really enjoyed having, I think you guys are gonna love it. I wanna briefly talk about the sponsor of this episode, which is Epidemic Sound. And I'm very grateful for their support because it's helping to keep this podcast running. You guys know I care a lot about crafting the perfect audiovisual experience that includes all the details, so the music and the sound design. It's just really important to get it all right to bring things to life. And that is what makes Epidemic Sound really amazing. It's a really powerful tool for online video creators. They have an amazing library of music that you can use for your videos that you want to monetize online. And you don't have to worry about getting demonetized or having your videos taken down. All of their tracks are professionally produced by a diverse collection of artists. They're adding new music every week and they have over 90,000 sounds in their sound effect library. So it's really good to feel solid about having that as an option. One thing I really like about Epidemic Sound is that they include stems for the tracks. So you can just pull the pieces that you really like. Maybe you only want certain instruments from a track or you want to introduce them one at a time to build tension. It's really cool. They offer different plans. So there's an option for everyone, no matter the size of your production, but even their most basic plan covers most platforms, including YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and podcasts. So if you're interested in checking them out, I have a link in the description. And with that, you can get a free month and two months, 50% off if you use the discount code NBP50. And what's really cool is everything that you post on social media using assets from Epidemic Sound during your trial, even if you cancel, is protected. So you're fine. Thank you, Epidemic Sound, for supporting this podcast and sponsoring this video. And having said all of that, let's dive in. I, I love how my jar is just large and you just have a little cute mason jar i am a big, I am a big mason jar i'm a big like water drinker so this is so am i hey well apparently not hey you picked the smaller jar out of respect for my guest i need my guest to be best hydrated. i'm your guest in my own studio <laughs> yeah yes this is um dual guesting here. this is how i live my life i'm always the main character you're the main character even when you're in my studio uh, no, I don't know. I don't think I can be the main character in your studio. Mm, no, no, you're, you're leading the charge on this, so take it away. You have an incredible amount of energy. Like, even in the setup of this podcast here in the studio, you're like, let's do it, you know, like charging <laughs> forward. And mm. this has been my experience of you every time mm. we have hung out, you know, in Cyprus. The, the Almost like the tribal clapping that inspired me to jump yes. into the water. Where does that come from? Because I think this is something people are fascinated by. It's like the, it's the Johnny effect. It's like this charging forward. You're posting these incredible videos and obviously you have a big team around you and we can, we can go into that, yeah. but you're charging forward, you know, posting these incredible videos each week. A production quality that's like people are confused mm. how you do it you know how does this happen where does this come from that is a great question and i actually don't have an, a full answer meaning it's me this is who i am this is all i know mm -hmm. and thus i don't really know any different were you like this as a kid yes but applied to so many different things not like in any sort of productive sense yeah. i just had a really intense almost frenetic energy which was as a kid as a kid with like severe add i now see in retrospect it was not diagnosed till i was like 26 but like that was not like that was channeled towards sort of attention seeking behavior and mm. kind of like 
uh, some creative behavior, but not really anything special. Like I wasn't mm. really good at art or school or anything. I wasn't good at anything. I was mm. kind of a late bloomer. So it was very scattered, sort of unproductive, un um, rewarded energy mm. as a kid. And, uh, and I think I had a real sense of myself that, that I was not smart or successful or going to really do anything special. I was kind of like mediocre. Was, so it was, was manifested as like self-doubt. Major self-doubt, major, just pretty entrenched, uh, narratives about like who I was and what my value was to the world. Cause you felt dysfunctional. Yeah. I didn't fit into any of the the rubrics of success yeah. as a kid and my energy was seen as a um annoyance as a pester it was never seen as like a, a value you know yeah. it was never channeled in a way that was valuable it was seen as like you're just sort of can't contain yourself like it was sort of i wasn't like a like i didn't have like major behavioral issues but it just was never rewarded you just have big energy yeah and i, I think i always did I think as an adult, the, the big moment for me where that energy started to become like an asset as opposed to a liability mm -hmm. was when I started to realize that like, oh, the rules that are sort of rewarded in school are not the rules that are rewarded in the real world. Right. Meaning there's a lot of other rules that a lot of other people play by yeah. um, that are valuable, not just in the economy. Because obviously those are certain rules, but just in terms of relationships, in terms of creativity, and I don't have to follow the yeah. perform on a multiple choice test type rules to be successful. And when I started to realize that, that's when I was like, oh shit, I could like harness this energy to like make this thing happen, to start this like wedding business. And we started like a wedding video business and like, I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. And so I'm going to learn cameras and learn all this stuff and like... I'm going to learn animation. I'm going to learn graphic design. And I'm going to turn this into some business. And like suddenly my energy could be like this fixation that that would just roll on itself. And yeah. something that was creative and entrepreneurial and like – and that was rewarded. And so I kept doing it. Right. But this is paired with a questioning that you have that I've noticed mm. um, is a through line in your life it seems. It, it, it seems like things didn't work, but you were at least had the curiosity and the courage to explore why, right? Like the first thing I think of is leaving the church, mm -hmm. you know, um, it seems like that was a system that was inflexible to this kind of out of the box energy that you yes. have. Yeah. And it, you know, it didn't happen until adulthood. Right. But eventually you were like, it seems like you go through every facet of your life and just ex question it. So it's it's curious with the, with the Mormon Church. It's sort of a double edged sword because while the Mormon Church is inflexible to certain unorthodox questioning and thinking and doing things differently, the Mormon Church is also to be credited for a lot of my industrious nature. And I wanted to explore that because yeah. you've mentioned this to me before. Yeah. Your initial answer goes further back to just, you had this big energy ADHD, yeah. but you've also pointed to like the work ethic that that crafted. Yes. And that is more of, I would say the endurance, the work ethic, the work ethic and the value on like just hunker down and, and do hard work. The energy and the kind of creativity and the sort of all over the place, do things differently was that more innate mm -hmm. me. But the Mormon church was this framework of we work hard, we get things done, we perform, we're always growing, we're always getting better. And I think, again, there was a sort of a confusing melding of those ideas when I was a kid. And as I got older, I realized that that work ethic, and especially on my mission, actually my mission was my big transition point. When I was 19, I got sent to Mexico for two years mm. through missionary. A decision I made, but didn't really make. The, the culture made it. I sort of was culturally automated into that. And that was the transition from like school, formal schooling into like being thrown out into the wild. When you're on a mission, they don't tell you how to do it. All they say is like, go talk to as many people as you can and baptize as many of them as you possibly can. And you have to go through all these processes to baptize, to right. get someone baptized. So the whole thing is about how do you get someone baptized? There's no like handbook. There's There's like rules and stuff. There's no way to do it. And so I'm like, okay, I got to baptize people. I'm going to freaking grind to do whatever <laughs> I need to do to baptize people. And there's no rule book. Like I don't have to fill out a multiple choice test. But that, but that's not taught. Like you're, you're making it sound like hard work is taught, but 
it was your own brain that went, I'm going to push this to its absolute maximum. Like, where did that come from? But the, it wasn't taught. It was modeled by the culture when everyone around you was also doing that is also doing that. Like in high school, even we don't party. We don't do anything. We actually wake up at 530 every morning. And that's and enforced. To, that's enforced. Oh, yeah. You major, major shame structures around uh, this kind of sinful behavior. So instead, you have teenagers waking up at 5.30 and going to what we call seminary, which is like Bible study, at 6 a.m. before they go to high school. Like before they go to high school, I was going to a, to a study every morning, every morning, every weekday, starting my day at 6 a.m. All of my peers were starting their day at 8 and like going in. I had been up since 6 reading the scriptures, you know. And so when you – and this is not just Mormonism. This is any orthodox – religious framework mm -hmm. where there is shame structures around keeping people in line so they're not partying they're not indulging they're sticking to things so you learn how to obey and, and what do you mean by that like shaming as in there's something wrong with you if you if you drink alcohol or coffee in the mormon church you are shamed that's wrong not only are you shamed because god you've just sinned and that's bad but the people around you will judge you right and so you have all of these social structures. You have a God structure that's like, you're bad if you do this. And it helps create large groups of people behaving in these rigid ways. All Orthodox religions know this. This is how they keep people in line. And, um, and it's why it's so hard to leave. This is why it's so hard to leave Orthodox, you know, ultra-Orthodox Judaism. Uh, it's incredibly hard to leave because you are in it. And it's you're all, all in and you're all out. Right. It's a very good, like, retention tool. Shame. Shame is a powerful thing. So... I, that wasn't taught, but it was modeled and created for me that like you work hard, you have a work ethic. And then on my mission, it was a bunch of young guys who were all incentivized to be fucking hard workers right. and to just go hard. And it's a competition kind of, and you're a 19 year old kid. Like while all of my peers were like freshmen in college getting drunk in their fraternity, I was on the streets of Tijuana. Right sweating every day in a shirt and tie walking up hills knocking on people's doors and speaking to them and trying to convince them in mm -hmm. spanish to join the mormon church and then i was on in street markets i created this idea of like a street market we go to the sobre ruedas like the little like uh, street markets and like preach there and like get people and i created all these like sort of entrepreneurial ways of like getting people in the door and I got a lot of people in the door. Yeah. Converted a lot of people to Mormonism. Subtle flex. I Low mean, flex. or subtle, like <laughs> me, a culpa, like, sorry. Like I, okay. So I wanted to ask you about the ethics of that though. Like, how do you feel looking back on, on your mission and, and the ethics of, of mission, mission work in general? Yeah. Boy. Um, that's a loaded one. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hard one because, and this is a really, difficult paradox with my whole relationship with the church. The church is to be credited with a lot of the like lifestyle disciplines that I really believe in, in terms of like, I have values. I have like really firm values that like I hold on to and I embody in my life. And yet the church is also responsible for a lot of shame and trauma. And that is exactly what my mission was as well. Responsible for giving me all of these amazing skills, the ability to, you know, I talked to thousands and thousands of people in a different language and learned about their lives and re like for two years, that's all I did every day. I speak a new language because of that. I would never, I'm an American. I would never, ever learn to speak Spanish fluently. And yet I have that. I learned to work hard. I learned about the world. I got thrust into the slums of Tijuana. I learned about borders because I was on a border and I got fascinated by that. Like my whole world was opened up yeah. and yet my mandate during those two years was to one way or another pressure people into joining the church and i did pressure i pressured people and sometimes manipulated people how which is really shameful and really really um something i grapple with that because of the incentive structure of numbers counting every baptism every month there was a newsletter that would go out to all the missionaries that wow. was like Here's the mission, the companionship of the month, the people who baptized the most. There were stats on every companionship, every district, how much they baptized. And so it's like a game show. It's like a little mini corporation. It's like a whatever, like we were out there competing. And so we did whatever it took to get people baptized. And I feel deeply, not even conflicted, unambiguously 
regretful for having for the for the moments where I would where I would tell people you promised that you would come to church. You promised. Oh, wow. You promised God that you would come to church. You're betraying God by not doing this. Even now, I feel just like sick, a little sickened by the fact that I would oh. stoop to that level. And again, I look I look back at it as like a young guy, you know, in a system of of really hardcore cultural intensity and shame and like. I try to have generosity for that 19 year old, 20 year old kid, but, um, that was me, you know, I made those decisions. So yeah, it is this grand paradox of great treasure for what it gave to me and great shame for what I participated in. Yeah. Wow. It's so fascinating to me that they teach you to be able to speak on behalf of God, like to use that as, as a way of convincing someone you know, because I believe in God, but in no situation, in no scenario would I ever like try to speak on behalf of that, right? Yeah. Or to like push it on somebody because it just I just don't think that works. But you felt that, like were people genuinely converting? You felt th- th- these tactics were leading to results? Yeah, yeah, wow. there were people. Whether in in a lot of cases, and I'm painting it like I was pressuring all these people, and there were, and again, this gets to a more inconvenient sort of paradox of like there were actually some really beautiful moments too where right. people I remember one time I was in this village south of Tijuana called Rosarito and we had stumbled upon this guy up in the mountains like a, a living in this like little tiny village outside of the village and like we had really had a good connection with him and we taught him about the mm. message which the message is about a young boy in upstate New York who saw God and restored the real church and that's the Mormon church he really resonated with it. He was like, wow, this is, I feel a lot. And we gave him the Book of Mormon and he read it. And it's the whole sort of archetypal story of like what you hear about when the greatest missionaries went out mm-hmm. and they give the Book of Mormon to someone and the person reads it and they're illuminated. And person, and he was like, I want to be baptized. But so what's fascinating about this is that, yeah, that, I mean, these stories wouldn't spread and reach people if there weren't elements of it that are really beautiful and meaningful right? and resonant and yeah and there i think there are really powerful lessons in all major religions uh, teachings and and almost like guidelines for navigating life mm-hmm. right it's it's kind of like i think i understand what you're saying where like i think the part that of you that feels regretful i mean correct me if i'm wrong here is the part where it, it crosses over into instead of like a, a framework or a guide line to follow it turns into pressing something on someone mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right yep and there's a moral weight to that yep. that's attached you know instead of letting someone come around at their own pace or at their own time yes right? yep precisely i think that's right and i think when you're a missionary you are inherently a salesperson for the church evangelizing <laughs> is an act of salesmanship you're trying to pitch and convince people yeah. that this church is real and you are training to do that at all times. You're getting better at it. You are pr- pressurized or incentivized to do it better. So, um, it's a yeah, it's a complicated, multi-tiered thing that gave me a lot, and also is morally and ethically uh, dubious in a lot of ways. Even the people that had those meaningful experiences, I think the bottom line, even those meaningful experiences, all of that. I still feel like I was made to be a volunteer salesman for the Mormon church for two years. And it's an organization that I deeply disagree with. And um, so no matter what, I just feel like that was that that is something I just don't support and and I regret in a big way. So the video that you did about leaving the church was Mm -hmm. incredible. Really Mm -hmm. well done. Huge reaction. Yeah. Um, were you surprised by the reaction or you knew it was, you knew that was going to make, I knew there was going to be, I knew there was going to be, I thought it was going to be a potent, a deep, but narrow potency among people who could resonate. I I guess I realized that like, there's a deeper fascination among the general population of just like Mormon church or just orthodoxy generally. And then what I didn't expect that was really interesting was, and that really opened my mind was, Tons of people from like Baptist and and ultra orthodox Judaism and all this stuff came forth in the comments. And were wow. like, dude, this is exactly the same thing. And that's when I started to develop my whole entire grand theory around 
orthodox religions and shame structures was built from just reading the comments. I was like, oh, we all went through this. This is just the same playbook transposed into all these different doctrines. Yeah. Same thing. It's the same exact thing. It's yeah. how you control people. Were there negative repercussions in your personal life with this? Because I know that like that's always so tricky to navigate. Yeah. That's what makes it so hard to talk about these things yeah. publicly, right? Yeah. No, there weren't. I think I waited to a point where I had healed a lot of those relationships like yeah. with my parents, with friends, uh, to w- or more actually more common, my the friends that were in it had left. Most of my friends had left. So the church is losing a lot of people. It is, like all religions at this point. You know, there's an exodus generally from organized religion. But yeah, the Mormon church is definitely on the fritz um, in the United States. Now, in Brazil, right. in Ghana, things are going great for the church. You know, I don't know actually those facts. But like, it, ab- the church is growing significantly abroad. Wow. And... Uh, and there are loads of missionaries going out the door to those yeah. places to convert people and build the church yeah. around the world. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I would say as it pertains to my work today, it's impossible to decouple my Mormon upbringing. It's so deeply in, intertwined into my curiosity, mm-hmm. into my openness for learning, into and then leaving the church was an act of questioning of, of not settling for what I've been told, but deeply questioning. Yeah. And I exited the church. And at the same time of exiting the church, I entered journalism. Like journalism is the same thing, which is like we question, we like, we like push until we have the facts and then we communicate it. Those leaving the church and journalism like collided at the same mm-hmm. time. And that really pushed me into this era of my life of just being like a hyper curious person. Yeah. He like doesn't settle for the typical explanation. Yeah. But, you know, I don't know. That sparked a lot of thoughts for me. Like mainstream journalism has been having its own crisis, which is kind of interesting because yeah. the timing of your career in this world yeah. coincides with like there's more and more individual journalists, right, who are doing their own thing. You know, they run a sub stack or yeah, have yeah. like a YouTube channel because there's so much distrust in in bigger institutions. Yeah. Yeah. It's a it's a totally interesting. Have you time. thought about the timing of 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 all of this? Absolutely. And yeah, it's it's at once scary and exciting. I think it's great. I think it's great that, that there's a questioning of a lot of. of I think so, too. And yet, and yet, and yet, yes. and yet, <laughs> I shouldn't say just great. <laughs> there is this, it's almost like I start to go down this thing where I, I see how much freedom I have as a journalist yeah. to say whatever I want. Yeah. And I get things wrong sometimes. And I have incentives, especially when, when my journalism is subtly guided by the invisible hand of the YouTube algorithm yeah. an attention economy ad driven experience, which like to some extent, all media, free media is the ad the, journalism and advertising have been walking side by side f- forever. As long as there's been journalism, there has been advertising supporting that journalism. But um, I see how whimsical the winds of change the, on these platforms can push me. And yeah. I, again, I hold really strong, but like I feel those, those incentives. And then I think if the New York times or the wall street journal or the economist didn't exist, and it was just a bunch of guys like me trying to do their best boy, like it would be really hard to, to, to know what's real. It'd be really hard. Well, it is really hard to know what's real. It already is right yeah. now. It already is. And, but and I think I mean I guess when I said this is great, it's because I I think you're doing great work. But also there are other individuals out there. You have been criticized online, yeah, in a big way on multiple occasions. And it's it's good that there's people that like you know have caught you on moments where things got a little bit loose, yep. right? And I think what's been incredible is if I, I hope I understand the details of the story correctly. Like you got criticized for a video mm-hmm. and then you managed, it was part of a series and you brought them onto your yep, team. Yep. 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 To help with to the rest get of the series. It more accurate. 
what happened there is exactly what the best version of independent storytellers, journalists, disagreeing and having a discourse right. could look like. It's exactly right. I got a big sort of factual framing thing wrong on this European series. Got called out by this Dutch YouTuber who uh, who's like a has a degree in history and is doing a history thing and he called it out. Had a really he had a really good debunk of, of like a one big part of my video and I responded and was like you are absolutely right. Was that hard? Um yes, it was hard because I have a defensiveness of course because I get ripped up on the internet all the time by people like you got this wrong. I watched his thing and it was this measured good faith argument which is so rare on the internet that's so the, rare. that is the problem that yeah. there's checks and balances like a person like that is doing is doing a is doing god's work yes. in my opinion yes you know in in the pursuit of truth right yes but it's so hard to sift that from the noise yes because i'm sure i'm sure elsewhere on the internet anybody just wanting to anyone having a bad day the can just yes the incentive is not to be good faith it is the the good feeling that people get on twitter and in the youtube comments is the snarky low blow bad faith argument it just feels good i don't know what it is about human psychology but that in the anonymous world of the internet is just an amazing thing it just yeah. buzzes people the the rigorous good faith discourse which is like more common in academia and kind of more sophisticated like like information circles is way harder it's way more arduous and it is way less zingy i think for yeah. people and so when i saw that i was like hell yes to this so i commented and said you are absolutely right i was wrong i am sorry and then i brought him on to help fact check the second piece and then he wrote the third part of the series and that's incredible he wrote it and he did an amazing job and we collaborated and it was awesome and his career was made off of dunking on me and i freaking love him for it he's he got like a hundred thousand subs that's awesome he like started with 500 when he made the video wow and he just his what's career, his name um his channel is called past present cool it's fantastic his name is Joachim. he's a friend now he's on our cool. slack i chat with him cool. he's a he's a cool guy and this was like an amazing moment of like good faith discourse if that could be the model of independent yeah. voices amazing yeah. but too bad that that's just like a utopian yeah pipe dream that's not how it's gonna be yeah so does does online criticism get to you ever because i gotta say as a as a sensitive person i mean yeah. i'm a giant critic of myself yeah yeah yep. and so if anybody says something that i'm secretly feeling yeah you know because i could always do better yes then that that gets me yeah like it just it's and sometimes i feel like i'm knocked on my ass yeah and a bit demotivated yeah because i'm like oh shit they're right it's it's pretty amazing to me that even after all the years of being in this and i have kind of thick skin and i cover really complicated topics with people have a lot of emotional feelings about it and even after all these years my my skin is never thick enough to yeah. just be completely devoid of being affected by the youtube comments yeah even though i know that it's like some kid in his basement like doing some power dynamic thing where he like feels cool saying yeah. some like low blow thing it still gets to me because i'm a human being and it's like i'm not sure that'll ever go away i've definitely my skin is thickened but i'm not sure it'll ever thicken enough to like to like make those things go away um the more bad faith they are the easier they are to dismiss it's those ones that ye exactly what you said where they're like a little close to home or they are kind of a bad faith take on like they're basically exploiting one little thing that I missed, but making it seem like a huge deal. Even though in my mind, I'm like, this is not a huge deal. Like this. Yeah. I skirted over that. Um, those are the ones where I, they, they sort of get to me. Yeah. They still do. And I wish they didn't. Like, I think every YouTuber is just like, I wish I could just not care about this. Is it weird? Because you've, you've gotten to a stage now where your channel's huge, you know? I mean, that's, a, that's relative, right? It's subjective, but yeah, yeah. It, you're, you're reaching a tremendous amount of people with, Every upload. Mm -hmm. Is it weird that you're a concept for people that is out of your control? Like people will use your face, you know, and people will successfully use your face and it clicks on YouTube, right? Yeah. Is that weird to you ever that there's a, it's not, it's not even, it's not, it's not this guy. It's Johnny yeah. Harris. Yeah. It's the symbol component of it is actually comforting. Strangely. This really? Is weird. This is weird. But like, you know, my partner is had her channel. 
and it was more lifestyle. It was more personal. She shared our travels. She shared her mental health. Like it was very personal. Mm -hmm. And I saw her grow and then realize I don't want to do this. I don't yeah. want my world, my life, my personal experience to be the symbol, to be the thing that people, to, that is sort of the currency that the internet deals in. Yeah. When that started to happen a couple of years ago, I tightened the screws down on my content, even my like Insta stories and stuff. And I made it about stories and about this little brand that I right, have, right. a guy who likes my, and it's a, it's a shadow of my real self. I am a curious guy who's surrounded in maps and is curious and a little bit chaotic. Like that is me, but I've truly and intentionally curated it as a thing that can be symbolized and, and remixed and tossed around mm -hmm. because it's not personal. I don't, don't, I don't feel like they're doing that to me, yeah. the, the guy, the human who has feelings, they're doing it to a, to an archetype. That's very comforting, actually. So when I see people do that and they talk about me, like I like like I have this there's this meme going around. It's like, is Johnny Harris CIA? And it's like a real like actual like has a has a surprising amount of traction meme. Really? Is Johnny Harris CIA? Like, like what? I kind of love it. But are you though? I could be. <laughs> you know, we don't know. Um, this is a well-practiced answer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, um, <laughs> no, all these tactics. What I love about that is it represents this idea that like people can truly look at me as this brand, as this person that could be anyone. Yeah, they could be living this wild life, and they don't know that like yeah, I live like the life that I live. <laughs> like if they saw it, I, sometimes I'll be like down brushing my teeth with my kids, and I'll be like. If the guys who think I'm CIA just could see me right now, I'm like this tired guy who's like renovating my house, but I'm like brushing my teeth with my kids right now, like in my basement of my in-laws. And I'm like, they could just see me right now. Like, I'm just a dude. Like it would be actually kind of disappointing to them. I kind of like that they just have this like very pared down version. Yeah. Everyone knows CIA agents don't brush their teeth. No, they no. just <laughs> mouthwash. It's more efficient. <clears throat> no, you but know I get what, what you're saying. Yeah, I get what you're you know, saying. Just this basic dude. Yeah. Um, I've been t very intentional. I don't share travel. I don't travel vlogs yeah. anymore. I don't share. Yeah. Insta and you guys story. did do that. Big time. Big time. Big time. Like our, Dude. with our family and our kids. And all of that was a big thing. And, wow. and now it's just not. Okay. Here's a funny story. I'm ready. That's 100% related to this. I remember watching a video of yours where you were traveling with your boys, mm. you is and your boys. And, and it was like, it was like in Portugal or something. Mm. And, I was watching this with my mom and my mom was like, you know, and she's a wonderful person. You talked to her earlier, but she was like, oh my God, that's, that's a, that's crazy to be traveling with your children like uh, that. You know, it's very uh, hard. Uh. And I don't think it was meant as a judgment on you guys, but you know, when you're sharing your life like that, you're inviting opinion. Yep. And I had this picture actually of the dynamic you guys had that was wrong. You're yeah. actually a super present dad. Because it seemed like you guys were crazy traveling busy all the time. Mm -hmm. You're actually a super present dad who stops at like 5 p.m. You know, you're playing Zelda with them and like you're you really make a huge effort. It goes to show you, you really have no clue, you have no clue. what's going yeah. on in people's lives. Yeah. But I've I have struggled with this because I've had the same problem I think is has faced, which is that like I go towards the very personal. Yeah. And and then that can get really weird and gross sometimes where people think they know you or yeah you know i'll go on dates and the girl mm, will tell has me all these on ideas. the date that Whoa. she's already seen my videos and i'm oh like god. oh god you know wow so that's tricky but the problem i have is that all of the most interesting stories to me are deeply personal like i i like telling stories about the world but through my lens yeah yeah i my analogy is always i like being virgil mm, okay i'm mm -hmm. your guide through hell mm -hmm. and for me that's just like that just works because i can i and i like to point to my own flaws too as i'm figuring it out mm -hmm. so that i'm not pointing at other people's mm -hmm. flaws mm -hmm. so this is a conundrum i have it's a major conundrum faced. and because and what's tricky about your world is like it's natural to you but like that also is a major value that you bring like that's why people want like and your people stories, love personal they love personal and and also you and i find this in conversation with you where it's like seeing the world through your lens is a valuable experience it is yeah. it's like it, it gives a, 
a, a, another view that I think is really valuable. And so you've clearly created that value. How do you continue to do that while also protecting yourself and protecting a version of it? And I don't know the answer for you. But I do think a podcast is, is this is my yeah. latest attempt. Yeah. Because a conversation with, with someone, it, it means I don't have to necessarily show you what's in my fridge. Yes. Right? Like yeah. we can talk about it and I'm sharing openly. Yep. But you're not. You know, you're you're here in this conversation if you're listening. Yeah. I think. Yeah, absolutely. But it's there's a, there. You know, I have my personal life as well. I think it's really important to protect parts of yourself when yeah. you when you. I, I don't think that we are built to, to 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 be in communion with millions of humans. I don't think we are. I don't think we can really fathom that. And I think there's some pretty dark like byproducts to that mm -hmm. experience. Um. And in fact, I know that I, I sort of know that empirically. Um, and so I think that any version of, of doing this work comes with a, 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 a vigilance. When I talk to people who are getting into this, I'm like, and everyone has to learn it in their own way, but like learn what you are protecting for yourself, mm -hmm. that, that you are not monetizing, that you're not sharing, yeah. that you're not turning into economic value or even attention for your community. Like, learn what is yours. And I have a lot of that. And even when I was doing a little more personal stuff, I, I picked up on this. And I'm really into moss. Like, moss is, like, a big part of my oh, life. Oh, yeah. Moss, like moss, the stuff like, that like grows, the green in stuff. forests. <laughs> yeah, or, like, actually what the, the the people who are into this say, mosses. Like, I'm into mosses. Oh, really? It's plural. Because I thought you almost, I almost thought you said moths. Oh, moths. <laughs> And I was like, I, moth. So I am, so, I mean, just as esoteric, like I could be just as soon into moths as I am into moss. <laughs> like they're basically the same thing. Kind of weird to be like into, right? I'm into moss or mosses. For me, it's weirder to be into moths. I think you're right. I think it's marginally weirder. It's like, cool. It's, it's cool. But if you were like collecting those. It would be weird. It would be weird. Like moth to the flame. I'm into mosses. Moss. Okay. The thing that's in forests. Freaking love it. Like I'm, I'm so I have a moss garden. That I'm just like, I cultivate. That's amazing. There was a big time when Izzy was always like, dude, make a video about moss. You're super into moss. And I was like, no. <laughs> yeah. No. Amazing. Moss is mine. Oh. I'm not going to share. I'm not going to tell you why I fucking love moss. Moss is mine. Power I, move. I am not <laughs> monetizing this. I've monetized all my other interests. Yeah. I've monetized my interest in maps. Yeah. And and you gain something huge. I have a job where I get to be surrounded by maps. You can yeah. buy maps off eBay and tell the world about them. Awesome. But you, there is a trade-off there, and I think this is the thing that my – if I could talk to myself five years ago, I would have said very clearly there is a trade-off. In the same way that when you go on a trip, all expenses paid because the brand is paying for you to go to Alberta to do this big road trip, free trip. No. If you have to document it, it is a transaction. Something is lost. Something is gained, but it is a trade-off. And, and if you know what you're doing – if you go understand the consequences, yes. then go for it. Go you for know, it. yeah. And you have to, and you do. The the thing about this work is having some wise sage YouTuber tell you that is not going to change it. You're going to do it. You have to go figure. And it that out. And that was what I was going to say. It seems like you. This is good advice. This is fantastic advice. But it seems like there is no way to fully get around accidentally crossing your own boundaries. Absolutely. To figure out, you kind of have to know where the yeah. lines are, and you have to learn the ramifications and things like that. So I think for me. Having an online community, the pros far outweigh the cons, yeah. at least for me. And the reason that is the case, the reason why it's so like that is because I've deep, I've created large boundaries around what I will share and what my purpose is. And luckily, my thing is about stories. I tell stories about topics. It doesn't need to be about me. I'm a right. delivery mechanism. I am a character. Uh, I'm, I'm more than a character because it truly is a echo of who i actually am. and you do share your opinions yeah i do i share my opinions uh, and i like and you don't POV, hide that yeah for sure like i that is there's a blurry line but i'm protected to a degree and i think yeah. everyone needs that kind of protection so it's very intentional it is now it wasn't at first uh, at first it was a little more sloppy now it's deeply intentional interesting yeah yeah i just i've learned too much about this and i, and I just have no interest in I think there was the buzz in the early years of just like, oh, this is so cool that I get to do this for my job. I'm going to do whatever it takes. So yeah. like, if I have to vlog this trip, I have to Insta story every moment of my like time in Italy. Like I'm going to do it. Yeah. And now I'm like, no, like I know I would get more engagement if I did that. I know that I would, that that would be the, the world of success is having a more parasocial mm -hmm. experience. Um, not worth the trade off.
It's like a wiser version of you know what I've learned over the years. That's amazing and yeah. very powerful. Um, I want to switch back to like work and work ethic and identity attached mm-hmm. to it mm-hmm. because there's a lot there's a lot there and you've and you're like a you're, you're a man of extremes mm-hmm. which i feel as well mm-hmm. you've got your intense seasons of work you call them seasons yep. right seasons of work and then and then seasons of rest yes. it seems like yep. i am curious about kind of where you're at with all of that because yeah. you had you called it a juniper season. Yes, my juniper season. What is it? What was that? First of all, well, I have a visual. There's always a visual, right? There's always a visual for anything. This is my juniper season. There it is. It's That's a jun- amazing. It's a juniper branch with juniper berries. That is. A, I've actually. I've never seen this. You've never seen this. Close up. Yeah, this is my juniper branch. I after ten years of kind of grinding, it's like after college, built all this stuff. It was growing Vox borders and then translating it to independent and that grew and all the things I had finally hit a moment where I felt like I was a pawn in the capitalist machine. Yeah. And I was doing what every human since the agricultural revolution had done, uh, find something that I can make value out of and exploit it to the greatest degree. Right. And I learned to do that and I optimized around it. Like every other human is the most predictable thing in the world. And I was like, now I have this job where, I actually have flexibility. I own my own business. I have this flexible thing and I'm still going to do this. I'm still right. going to show up at nine every day and stay till five and grind to till the second my nanny is off and then go home and take care of my children. Like my, my hunter gatherer ancestors or my, or I guess my like, like agricultural ancestors. No, like I, no, I'm not going to do this. It was, it was burnout really, but I had this whole like big deep, you know, history kind of component of it, of like, I'm going to rewire my relationship to work. And I took, and I got this tattoo and I sort of named it Juniper. It's like, this is my new persona, like this new version of myself, kind of hippy dippy, but like, it was like my sort of rebirth. It was really helpful. It was like putting a ritual to, if the Mormons taught me anything, it's like ritual around a transition is actually really effective for like pushing you into a new phase. So I went through this sabbatical phase, 2020. Two, 2021. I mean, 2022, it's hilarious to me that you call it a sabbatical phase because you were still posting bangers. I was still, we were still posting twice a month, but the team was growing. That's when we sort of started to build the team and is stepped in as like CEO. We had an operations manager, Laura, who's really good and like helping scale. And like, I was working three days a week though, sometimes two. And then I was taking huge amounts of time off. I took six weeks off in January. Uh, in February and then <laughs> huge for an American yeah 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 normal yeah. for I was, European I, I was taking European amounts of time <laughs> off and it was mind blowing but I gotta weeks. say even three years into living in France six yeah. weeks off it's like I cannot wrap my brain around that that's a that is a huge amount of time huge amount of time I went back to Oregon for six weeks it's amazing in July and August didn't work this was amazing it healed me in a huge way and it rewrote my that's value great. systems around oh, work work is this buzz and it's this dopamine and it's this cultural ritual of you are good you are contributing to the group and rest is like what are you doing and i rewrote that during this time now in september we ramped back up and we from a scaling perspective from a revenue need perspective because we're scaling we were like, we are going to grind. And we're going back into a season. And that's of life. life, right? Life will pull you back into yes. There's different phases. And I was ready to do it. I was ready to do it. I didn't resent work. And I think you told me this, which I really like, which is burnout is actually the association with work. It's not, you don't like your moments at work. It's, it's a not negative, that you're doing too negative much. emotions. It's a negative association. It, yeah. And I suddenly had this really positive. Associ- and, I, and so I've been in that season and since October. I've been grinding. I have been, I ramped up the machine again. Yeah. And so it's the machine and it's Jun- Juniper is one guy and the machine is the other. And so, oh, you, oh, I have another. I just got this five days ago. Whoa. I just got this tattoo five days ago. This is the machine. Yeah. You haven't said anything about this. Yeah. To me. This is, this is just my, this is my machine. Oh, oh, whoa. Whoa. You see it? Whoa. You see it? It's, it's the, uh, it's the machine, dude. Damn, dude. So this is me right now. This is who I am. All right. My, my initial reaction to that is that it it's it's intense. That's intense imagery because yeah. it, it does feel I don't have fully formed thoughts on 
the digital side of our lives that is just evolving at such a rapid pace. Yeah. But he's clearly there. Yeah. And this feels like a full on admission that yes. that is there. It's almost an embracing. An embracing you want to describe it actually? You want to describe the two tattoos yeah. for people so, listening? So, yeah. For those listening, I have a, on my left arm, a juniper branch. It is an organic, sprawling branch with these juniper berries. I love the juniper tree. It's beautiful. On my right arm, I have a mirror of that same branch, but it is made of circuitry and uh, microchips and digital branches, but it kind of has the same shape. What I realized when I re when I went into my juniper phase is, well, I didn't realize it then, but I was rejecting. I it was like, work is terrible. I resented it. I was like, Get out. I'm not a cog in your capitalist machine. Mm -hmm. When I came back to it this time around, I realized like, oh, hello, old friend. I see you. Like you are me. You are a part of me and you're not a part that I'm going to exile. What is it? The part that the is part work. That, the part that is that sits down and grinds. A workhorse. Who's just like, I'm going to do what you've seen this. You've seen this. Part. Yeah, I have. You know this part. This is the, this is the majority of the part that you know of me, which yeah. is I will grind to make this thing happen. I yeah. will make it good. It will be it will be on time. I will do whatever it takes to make it happen. That is the machine. And instead of reject that, yeah. I'm going to embrace it because it's a part of me that I'm really grateful for. It, there's a frenetic energy to it, yeah. which by the way, I am also trying to explore as well because there's a there's a it can be a, it can be also if left unchecked a little aggressive almost. Yes. Like it, it's yes. a it's it's a different kind of energy yeah. that bubbles up and I can kind of get into that mode. But it, it's really you got to you have to put very clear boundaries because that can just turn into this tornado. Yeah. And can, I didn't have boundaries around it for years. And I'm str I'm learning still. Because Absolutely. I find there are times in my life, too, where with a project, I'm like, I'm kind of in sink or swim mode. Like, this is just how I approach yeah. everything. Yep. 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 Extremes. And it, it is a bit extremes, you know. And and the thing is, it's like I will do what it takes to get this thing working. Which, if that is what I've learned, is that that is where my best work happens. And so, instead of trying to find this notion of like balance, my balance is just going to be like deep extremes on both ends. Meaning, I will go through these seasons of juniper, yeah. organic, just low key, zend out, rest, totally away from work, where yeah. my value system is completely transposed into these other things, these quieter things, nothing to do with the economy, nothing to do with the three and a half million subscribers. They're like, me quietly playing piano and cooking and like meditating. Yeah. And then I will flip a switch and I will come and I will go to this other extreme where I can visualize a story that I want to yeah. tell and work that I want to do. And and those are both valuable things. I don't need to reject one and embrace the other. I can embrace both at different times as long as, and this is vital, and I think this is sort of what you're saying, as long as I can decide that. I think before the machine ruled me because it was my value system is why I got validation from everyone. So I, I just did it. Right. And now what I'm learning and the reason why I have these, these, this ink on my body is I'm now learning that like these are both powers and these are both personas and I can choose which one to occupy. And to me, that's like just skills. So those are emotional skills that you develop with time. This is really fascinating to me. Um, and I, I agree with that, but in practice, what does this look like? How are you able to so effectively, I think the key to this working is that you switch off and you were saying this just before we were recording this mm. switch off hard, like yes, so hard, hard switch. So how so, do you do that? Cause that, that's the piece that is very difficult, especially in creative work or if you're like an entrepreneur yeah. or if you do anything that you pour yourself into yeah. that you're passionate about. It's, it's hard not to have the thought at 2 a.m. about it, right? Yeah. I was lucky to have this forced upon me when I was 24 and I had a kid and I was still in college. I don't know a professional career out, outside of having a child at home. Mm -hmm. And as a dad who wants to be extremely present and extremely there, I have a zero tolerance policy for like working late. I don't work late. I have... A nanny who is done at 4.30 and is and I at 4.15, we leave this office. There's no negotiating. There's no like, can you stay late? We go home. What that means mm. is that from between the hours of 8.30 and 4.30, we are, I mean, talk to anyone on the team. We are machines. We are robots. We are robots. We are, every second is accounted for. Not literally every second. 
Every yeah. minute is literally accounted for. And it's so weird because I think I would have judged you so hard for that. Yeah. Just that piece because I would be like, ugh. Yeah, it's I hate so, humans operate like that. Yeah. But I know the bigger picture, and I see. It's like you saw the bigger picture, yes. and you're like, these are these. Well, are I the- was forced to. Like, I, I didn't do this. I didn't design this. This was, holy shit, I got to get it all done. Yeah. It happens to be that during that compression, my brain sparks in ways that magic comes out. That's if I amazing. have a block from between nine and one to write a script, you better bet that that urgency – which is not fake urgency. It's real urgency. Mm-hmm. Because if I don't get that block done, then everything's going to be pushed back. I'm not going to get out on time or mm-hmm. I'm not going to get my stuff done. That urgency gets me going and I just grind. And and then, I, and then I'm off. And then – so the habit of being able to be off is because for 10 years at 4.30 – really, it used to be 5.30. We switched it back to 4.30 about three years ago. At 4.30, I am off and I have no choice because I'm home. And, and, I, and I've just learned to be off. And then the next morning I do it again. Now that is that works for a time, but I can only be a robot for so long before it starts to take a toll. And that yeah. is when I've learned about this like season of rest thing where it's like I can only be the robot for so long before I need to let my body and my mind like and I used to call it detox. I don't think of it like that anymore. I think I need to switch back. I need to nourish the other side of myself. I yeah. need to detox. This isn't bad. This is good. This is amazing that I have this skill. I'm going to go nourish this other side of myself. Right, right. Instead of looking at it at it as talks of toxic. Yeah, it's not toxins. toxic. I don't need to detox. I need to just go nourish this other thing. It's, And how do you develop that? Well, I was forced into it kind of, but also practice. Yeah. You have to practice doing that switch. And that yeah. switching, it, it it's uncomfortable because you're yeah. switching your neurology, dude. Like your neuro, your tracks are changing. You're, you're in a different space. Your neurology, yeah. your canals are different when you're in this headspace than that headspace. Learning to do that switch is like learning to play piano. You just have to practice. Yeah. Wow. This is really fascinating. And I mean, it's the Johnny. It is the Johnny effect. Like <laughs> you, Johnny it, effect. it's the, you make it happen. You yep. make it work. Like I, I, I gotta say there are very, I don't think I can think of anyone that I would have more faith in, in when faced with a project than you to mm. just make it work. Mm. You will make it happen. Well, so I think you, I don't know if it's just you. I don't want it to be it's that. It's not just me. But I think <laughs> I, I take a lot of inspiration, but I do think people are wired differently, you know? Yeah. I, th- I again, the origin story of how it all went down is, is hard for me. We've sort of traced back the, how it all went down, whether it was Mormonism or pre-wiring or whatever. And I don't know that. There's a lot of story. potential theories. Yeah. I mean, I even had the thought that like when you were saying you were a 19 year old Mormon missionary, I was like, Oh, that's so interesting. Maybe it was the fact that he couldn't pursue women, right? Yeah. Like all the theories, right? That he couldn't pursue women, so it wasn't a distraction. So he could kind of focus on this work of converting yes. people. And maybe you want to know the real theory that I actually think explains a lot of like successful people's endurance is they're trying to prove something. Right. I think in therapy in recent years, I've learned that a lot of my motivation comes from the satisfaction of proving wrong that all of my peers in fifth grade. And it's like, here I am this like 34 year old man who's like the young wounded part of me needs validation because he was felt like an idiot as a fifth grader. Right. Cause he had to meet with the teacher after school and go over special learning goals. And that was so shameful. But here I am this big, like powerful, rich dude. Who's like going to flex on the world. Like, I think a lot of people grind to just say fuck you to the world that made them feel small. Like I really think that that's true. And I know for me, absolutely, that is a part of the theory that we didn't really go into. But like that vindication is so incredibly powerful. And if you don't heal that part of yourself, yeah. those patterns will repeat themselves for your entire life. So yeah. that that is a part of my equation. I think it's part of a lot of people's equation. Well, and your your answer to that is therapy, or is it like a, just a, a curiosity about this? It's absolutely therapy. I I could have never unwired and spotted and understood the whole origin story of these deep patterns without a professional guide teaching me how to look at them and understand mm-hmm. them and recognize them not a chance i would have just intuitively like plotted that all together it's like it's like laughable it'd be like being like you could learn you could learn to speak italian 
if you just went into this room and you had a pamphlet from uh or you had a, a menu from a from like a pasta restaurant in rome and you're gonna learn italian not a chance you know like from reading one like menu like the amount of information and guidance and and repetition and skill needed to reshape your brain and look at these really tender deep parts you need a professional yeah. or you need some yeah i think you need a professional yeah yeah the the way my dad puts it that i love is that you know athletes without coaches don't exist like yeah so why can't we transfer that thinking to to our mind to our internal world to to the to the to our emotions that, a very difficult thing to navigate that dictates our entire reality our entire yeah. reality is nothing more than the synapses firing in our brain yeah. right now it is nothing else there's zero other objective reality it yeah. is our view so why wouldn't that be a thing that we would want to train yeah and th and think through our physical bodies it's it's obvious and intuitive yeah but our minds it's like no 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 we'll figure it out just like let it do the default thing yeah no yeah. we need a coach so i think that that healing happens through a lot of work it, it takes work but a coach or a guide or a therapist for me i don't know everyone has their own modality on how they want to do this but for me a professional therapist has yeah. completely transformed my life so what does what does a day in your life look like or what is your morning routine day day routine yep. because you you seem to squeeze so much in I squeeze a lot in on the weekdays i wake up at 5 30 in the morning i go make coffee in a Keurig, Keurig machine because i live in a basement right now because i'm renovating the house and I walk over to my electric piano and I put it on my headphones and I, and I play jazz piano for an hour. And I for an hour? For an hour, between 5.30 and 6.30. So you're, wow, you're really, every morning? Every, if for stints, I'll have other stints when I'm traveling and stuff that it just goes out the window. Yeah. But when I'm in a stint of home, yeah, for an hour I play jazz piano. Okay. And I and I practice. And I, um, and then at 6.40... The boys wake up and I shower the boys. I mean, Iz is up and we're we're showering the boys. We're getting them dressed. We're chatting with them. We have this like moment. Like I, b the boys waking up in the morning to me is like a core moment. It's like yeah. this is a moment we're going to all remember. And these it, mornings. Children also when they wake up are so. They're just punchy and silly and weird and funny. So fresh. And, and they're fresh and they're snuggly. And it's like that's a, that's a beautiful like. Moment. Yeah, it's you know, it's funny. Moment. I remember feeling that. I remember oh, waking I up and just being like, oh, the day is ahead of me, you yeah. know, like in the yeah. world would be so much yeah. simpler. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I think those are crucial moments. And so we have our moment. The boys then go up to their nanny. Izzy and I go to the gym. We do, we move our bodies because we will be sad if we don't move our bodies. We, you know, I run on a treadmill. I lift weights. I do this thing. So running weights. Yep. Do you follow weights. a particular plan? Yeah, I have a little plan that uh, some coach taught me. I'm on. I and then I have this co-pilot. Co-pilot like sponsored me, so like they gave me free their to their app. Cool. And so I have like a personal like coach there who like helps me with like this core stabilization lower back thing. <laughs> so I do like I do like a thirty minute thing. Like okay. we're thirty minutes at the gym from seven to seven thirty. Yeah. From well, we get we get we actually get to the gym always at seven twenty. <laughs> okay by, this by, is down by to the minute eight, by eight we have to be out if it's a monday we go to the grocery store and we shop for this studio which is a major value of mine every monday every monday is and i go to whole foods and we shop for the studio because there is nothing i value more in this life than quality food yeah quality products yes is one of the greatest things in the world now izzy and i would always say when we were scraping by on like yeah. black beans and rice in college when we have the means, yeah, the thing that we will spare no expense on is food. Yes, smoked salmon and the nice avocados and the expensive yogurt and the nice fresh bread. We will just spare no expense, which in the United States is a difficult thing to do. It's a difficult thing to do, yeah, and it's so expensive here. It's, it's so crazy. expensive, and luckily it's a business expense because it's the studio. So we yeah. go to the studio. So we get here. We are here by eight forty-five. Then at nine, my block starts. My sacred block. I have a sacred freaking block, and it is from nine to one. Nine to one is where everything happens. Everything, everything that matters in my work happens between nine and one. Sometimes nine and two if I'm lucky, but nine and one. 
and I psych myself out and I get ready and I hop around and I make a coffee and I like get a little smorgasbord of like smoked salmon and blah, 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 and like walnuts and all this stuff. And I go to my <laughs> desk, I put my headphones on, I find my Spotify. And I'm like, what's it going to be today? And I have like all kinds of music I listen to. And my block, it's a writing block usually. In a writing block, and it used to be like an animation editing block. I don't edit and animate anymore, yeah. sad face. But it's a writing block. So I sit down, I get into a script, and I'm writing, mapping Antarctica today. And I vibe, and I get serious, and I'm excited, and I start writing, and I start visualizing. And then I have a moment, and I turn behind me, and Tom Fox is there, sitting, chilling. And I go, Tom, what if we did this thing where at the beginning it was like these chords? And I go over to his desk, and I like put the chords down. And he's like, <laughs> oh, this is sick. And I'm like, okay, keep going with that. And I go back, and I keep writing. And then he starts freaking doing That's his great. thing. And it is just this jam. It's flow. It's like really cultivated, sacred flow. And it has an ending point, and I think that's really vital Maybe not for some people. For me, the fact that it ends, no, no, no. I don't think you can sustain flow. It has to have this sort of this sort of ending point, which is like for me, it's one p.m. and or two, and then at two, I'm I've sort of lost my energy. I stop all caffeine at noon, and I then move into like meetings, which are my least favorite thing in the world because I highly attention like i'm fidgety and like sitting down for yeah. a meeting like a conversation like this i'm buzzing but like a meeting where we're talking to a lawyer about something yeah. i is my nightmare so and luckily and we're not made to look at screens i don't feel like i'm with the person mm, interesting like i i love my like my parents for example yeah pieces i yeah. love talking to them i don't like talking to them on a on phone the it's just i get that emotional antsy. resonance interesting for me it's more just the lack the lack of like, I don't know. I don't know. Even this is even in-person meetings for me. So I go through meetings. I watch cuts. Yeah. All of this works. And this is so important because my partner is, has created a legitimate organization. Yeah. Of 12 full-time employees, a network of like 20 contractors that all somehow get paid on time, get benefits, get have all their information, have everything documented, all communicate with each other, all come to the meetings. I don't know how it works. I do not know how it works. I used to know how it worked when I, we were doing like a video or two a month because mm -hmm. I would touch it all. I now have no idea what's under the hood. That's crazy. And yet is and our production manager, Taryn, just have the whole thing dialed in where we can do these 30-minute ambitious deep dive videos and they publish once a week and they actually publish one week early on nebula so we actually have to be a way more than like a week ahead wow on every video every thumbnail every title all worked out that's great designed you guys it, have it you guys have it down to a science it's it's really dialed in and what it allows us to do is empower more people to step up into the business and touch the product so it's not just all on me yeah and that's what i was telling you earlier we were talking about i was like i this is the busiest time ever but my, my lower back isn't like kinked out and like I'm not like stressed because this organization is like this giant support machine that's like I'm a part of instead yeah. of like I'm carrying. I'm not carrying right. anything anymore other than like my tasks. My right. tasks are important, important. I have to write these things. I have to direct these things. But an organization goes a really long way for taking it off my shoulders and making it work. That's and that's, that is the masterpiece of my wife. Like that is the unsung part of this whole thing that like it is sung in the comments of every video. It's how on earth do you do this every week? And it's like, why are you looking at me? You know? And I feel conflicted. Well, cause it is your face. It's my face. I know. But like, it's this, when I see that, I'm like, it's unfair. I wish I could just shout yeah. to the rooftops. Like there's someone who's, who's, who's masterpiece. This yeah. is, you yeah. know, is, is a mastermind. She really is. And she has been since day one. She like hired her first employee when she had like 5,000 subscribers. And I, I had like 100,000. And I was like, I don't even have an employee. What are you doing? And she's like, <laughs> I need an employee. And what I was learning is that she, it's incredible. she could see yeah. the future. Wow. You, know? you guys are a great duo. Is that time block one single task from nine to one? Yes. Is it one oh, thing? It has to be. And I walk in when I walk into this door... I literally will be mumbling under my breath. Like, it's like a funny thing that they make fun of me in the studio for. Bosnia is the only video that matters. Bosnia is the only video that I'm making. There's only one video. There is only one video that we are ever making ever on our channel. And it is Bosnia. Like, I have to do this thing where I put the blinders on to be like, 
Bosnia. It's the only thing that matters. It's this map explainer. It's going to be great. And I get to my desk and it's the only thing that matters. And if somebody comes and they, everyone knows this now, but like if somebody comes and is like, Hey, so what's the deal with the lottery video? I'm like, <laughs> like, don't like, I can't, wow. I, this is the only thing that matters. It's like hyper, hyper, hyper fixated focus on that. And it's cultivated. It's cultivated from the night before I look at my calendar the night before and I'm like, Bosnia tomorrow night. I am. Yeah. See you there. You know what you look like? What, I've seen you before you're, you're in there. You look like a, a boxer. Yes. Hyping yourself <laughs> yes. up to go into the ring. Yes. Yes. That's what it feels like, dude. Cause I'm like, that's why I'm saying compression is where my best work happens. Cause if I know that magic has to happen in that time, there's yeah. this accountability. But did you struggle to, um, embrace this level of intensity when you were younger? Because it seemed like we touched on it. We explored that a little bit, but, we kind of looked at it sort of, I mean, I don't know. I, I got the sense you were giving, you know, your your view on things based on externally, like how it's seen. Yeah. But I feel like you are um, uninhibited now. And that requires an internal permission to be this level of intense, this level of expressive. And but it's been a val – the thing is it's been validated. Like I don't know if I would be this way if I hadn't been validated by the internet and the economy. Yeah, okay. And the, and the workforce. Like this, this is what's sad to me about looking at my childhood self hmm. and, and the way the system tells you what you're worth. If the, if the system hadn't signaled, oh, no, you can make money off of this and people on the internet will like you for it, I don't think I would have ever – blossomed and embraced it but isn't this the sort of anybody who is defending the capitalistic system capitalism mm -hmm. isn't that kind of the their point right which is that like incentives exist and human beings react to incentives it's our job obviously to get this the incentives right and they're often not right right but there's a powerful force at play Mm -hmm. where you're doing good, this really great work and you're getting reinforced for it. Yep. So here's all of this, yep. the, these the, resources. The, absolutely. And, and I am a believer in markets. Like I, I do believe in the notion of markets and transactions for not only human prosperity, but like for pulling something out of you that you wouldn't have the incentive to cultivate otherwise mm -hmm. I, I actually believe in that and i have a streak in me that's like hardcore cutthroat but what's really interesting is that you didn't take off immediately in your career this yeah. is a really interesting point you know in your late 20s right with vox borders and everything yeah things started to take off but really in your 30s it's been like explosion here's my critique because i could argue both sides like i said i i have deep belief in market dynamics and, and what they do to human psychology. And and that is one part. My critique is that it works much better for some people than others. Meaning I got lucky. I got really lucky that the flavor of the of the month when I was rising up at that exact time that you just mentioned, if I'd been born 10 years earlier, it, when it, it, I would not be rising up in my early 20s when web video was becoming the biggest thing, when uh, journalism was becoming independent, big, journalism. independent journalism, yeah. when internet journalism, when like tech journalism, te right. sort of tech journalism fusion, when um, sort of vlog aesthetic and vernacular on the internet was starting to become a thing. Like if I had born 10 years early, even seven years earlier – it all wouldn't have just worked out. And right. I happened to be the guy where the, all the things came together and the economy was like, yes to you. What about everyone else? Like if we're building yeah. an equitable society, then yeah, it worked out for me, but I'm not going to turn around and be like, well, because it worked out for me, it's going to work out for everyone because of incentives. Right. Like that's the big fallacy that like founders and like all the people who, who win big get wrong. They worked really hard. There's a lot of people working really hard and the market is not, pairing them up nicely with everything yeah and that's my critique is like the system the the system could oftentimes continue to make someone feel like they're worthless because their particular energy is not the energy of the day yeah and and so i think for me like i got really lucky that it got validated as a kid it wasn't validated and i 
hit, I sort of hit it. I learned to like sort of be ashamed of it. I learned to, that it wasn't cool, that I wasn't smart and all these things. And luckily I was able to blossom out of that because of a few dynamics. My mission being one of them again, my mission mm -hmm. deeply complicated. I'm like, Oh, my mission. That was so bad. Also, thank you for like helping me blossom. Intense experiences like that can coil you up like a spring i feel like and if you if it if it doesn't if you don't let it break you mm -hmm. it can be the superpower that you mm, have afterwards yeah. i think that's a really that's a really interesting you know metaphor. so i i get what you're saying the world is deeply unfair yeah very very unfair yeah very 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 unfair but you know there's there's something interesting to me about the trajectories different people take. It's hard for me to believe that with the intensity that you apply to what you, whatever it is you do, even just the setup of this podcast, you're like, it's podcast time. Let's do this. You know, <laughs> that it wouldn't have led you somewhere else that, you know, like I, I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a powerful river of energy mm. flowing through mm -hmm. you that all I think what it, what that requires is that to be channeled and the systems which you have developed yes. and done. Yes. Right. I and I really do believe that. I think I think the hindsight bias on this is so uh blinding because yeah, it all worked out and yet a few little pivots at a few times in my life or a few pivots in the economy or whatever or technology I could be living a very different life yeah. and, and this intensity, this, this enthusiasm for life could be kind of boxed up and put away in a little place that doesn't, that maybe comes out in little shadows, but yeah. I am very aware of how precarious that is because it wasn't, it wasn't meant to happen this way. I grew up in a small town in Southern Oregon. Yeah. I got bad grades. I didn't have some brilliant thing as a kid. I didn't have some like cool, brilliant skill as a kid it's just scary to think how any little micro tune to the to the to the path back could have could have changed everything. Yeah. So I don't know. That's like a deep, but, a, a non falsifiable conclusion. But like, then I agree with you. It's also a miracle that we even exist. Yeah. Yeah. Right? yeah exactly. That yeah, we're even could, sitting here having this yes, conversation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 You're what right. What all the ways one of my many ancestors just had to be shot by an arrow, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, for this, for me not to be here right now. Totally. So yeah, I guess what I'm so, saying is like, you could say about basically the, the big bang. <laughs> exactly. You know, yeah. Like, I, I guess, but, but honestly, you, you're pointing to something that's real. So I'm going to ask you a, a hard question. You know, there's so many people that are inspired by, I know a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm curious about journalism because of Johnny. Yeah. Like you're the poster child for that, I think, of doing it yourself, right? Um, and sharing your opinions where appropriate and doing a really good job. Yeah. What's your advice to someone who wants to do that, you know? Because yeah, yeah, obviously yeah. taking into consideration. Yeah, which is why I'm so rubbish at advice because I, I have this deep theory of like, oh, my God, how it all worked out. Um, I do have some I do have some advice, though. The, the reality is like there are some objective – Things that I did to, along the way and things that I've learned along the way that to me represent like the best chance of preparation for this type of work. This is this is this is advice that goes into any creative or any professional skill, which is setting your expectations for endurance. If you if you go into any craft without an expectation, a really clear grounded expectation that there's going to be a lot of not fun times as you learn it and as you get better at it and as you make things and they're really bad, then you are already writing your death certificate for that craft. Like you're already, you're already saying goodbye to it. You have to go in understanding that it is going to be years of dissatisfaction. It's going to be years of wondering if it ever gets better, if your work ever gets better, why doesn't it look like this? Mm. And that those years are the, the point of the whole thing. You have to get so much work out of your system. And every piece of work that you do is adding to that quota of the amount of bad work you have to get out of your system. And if you don't do that bad work, you'll never get better. And and that is that is like a law of nature to me. That is not even like – that's not advice. That is That is me describing a law of nature of getting better at your craft. And, and practicing something. So if you want to get into journalism, 
that just do a lot of work, write a lot of stuff. And, and, and if you're lucky, you find a place that will incentivize you in a market to write a lot of stuff, even if it's not for the thing that you want to do. For me, that was like all the bullshit jobs I took before Vox were like, I was just like animating things, but I was animating things for 40 hours a week and I was getting better because I was animating things for 40 hours a week. So that endurance is to me the most important component of any work that in that obsession. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, and I think every time you embark on a new endeavor, it's like prepare yourself for humble pie yeah. time again, which yeah. is something I'm learning repeatedly. Yes. I love exploring new things, Yeah. but every single time it is a bit of a slap in the face Yes. where yep. it's like, Whoa. Yeah. You think you're like all that? Yes. Yep. I'm sorry to say. Actually, you suck at this. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yep. And eventually you learn to embrace that. And eventually you you see the dynamics of like, oh, I'm going to start at zero and I'll get better with time, whatever. But when you're first starting out and you're starry eyed and you're excited yeah. and you hit that first year and your excitement dries up and you're just like, why am I doing this? I believe that the well of expectation, like the well of like motivation that gets you through those times is the cultivation of expectations you did beforehand. Yeah. You prepared yourself that this was going to be hard. Yeah. Um, so that that is my big thing. And yeah. then I guess... And you do... In some ways, you have to ignore short-term feedback, right? The world, it'll... Until it's working, the yeah. world will make it look like it's not working. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. And... You know, not... A couple of years ago, your channel was like a tenth of the size. Yeah. That's true. And you were doing great already, but like who knew it was going to get to this point? Yeah. Right? It's ignoring – here's what's tricky, and this is what I'm getting hung up on. It's ignoring short-term feedback but also absorbing short-term feedback in the sense that – this is actually – okay, here's my – here's my – here's the real zinger. This is a new <laughs> – this is a new thought that is newly packaged <laughs> straight out of the – straight out of the packaging <laughs> facility. <laughs> That I am going to present here. This is classic Johnny. This is, this is right just now. just been just the the bow has just been whoop, like put on the top of this package. It's unboxing it. an Apple product. We're, yes, we are now unboxing it for the first time. So I don't know how it's going to come out. It's actually not like controversial, but it's like this is a big thing I have. Wait, I think I just lost it. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. You, you this is fresh. This is up. fresh shit, dude. This is a fresh like big theory. Okay, wait. Um, what were we even? What were you saying? just saying? No, what were you just <laughs> saying? What were you literally just saying? You're saying I don't know. I think I lost it. Uh, it was humble pie. It was it was you're learning something. Oh, new. ignoring ignoring short term oh, yes, feedback, yes. but taking short term feedback. Fresh out of the fresh out of the end. Here it is. <laughs> <laughs> if you do anything creative, if you do anything creative, there is an impulse, especially if you're an artsy person and you're kind of like I want to make great art and I want to make things that are beautiful. There will be an impulse to want to defend your art, to make it beautiful and, and artistic. And there will be a natural resentment towards the audience that doesn't get it. Who's like, and you're like, oh, like they just don't get it. Like I'm making beautiful things and they just don't get it. My big thing is you're wrong. You're absolutely wrong. Your audience is your audience. They, they, are, the, they are the kingpins in all of this. They are the people who should rule what you are doing. If you have art that doesn't have an audience, then like you just have art and you can have it for you and that's great. Right. If we're talking about a professional context where you're trying to participate in an economy, you're trying to present something to the world that is artistic, then you by default are serving an audience. If you're trying to monetize your work, then you have to bow to what people want. I just hear so much like, People be like, I make films. I'm really into this, but like the audience just like doesn't appreciate good hmm. like cinema anymore. And I'm like, cool. Like, go make cool cinema for yourself. But if you're trying to participate in the market, right, you have to meet that demand. Yeah. And that's where I'm a big fan of markets. Where I'm like, people want something. Serve that audience. Find value for people, and and think of your work as value. Anyway, that's my that's my fresh out of the out of the press. Not well packaged yet. I'm still working on it. There's there's tweaks to this because I think it takes time. There's a lot of momentum on the internet. Like if you have the right core audience for something, that core audience can help you reach way more yeah. people if they're really pumped. That was excited. your journey, dude. That was my journey. <clears throat> and when you change formats, it can take time 
for mm, that mm -hmm, core audience mm -hmm. to develop again. And, mm -hmm. and so that's where I do think there's a bit of a delay sometimes. You know, my journey, it's funny. Okay, so over the course of those first four years that I ran my channel, I had like two videos sort of do well, but they were in French. So yes. I had the wrong core audience. This because is the one you sent me in 2017. Something like, yes, yeah, I sent you that. Wow, good memory. Yeah, I remember a lot of things. Because I was like, hey, I can speak French and Spanish. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and, and basically I had the wrong core audience. And so I was later down the road, a couple years later, I was trying to really get the channel going, making only English content because I felt more mm. comfortable expressing myself in abstract terms and emotions and whatnot in English. So I had the wrong core audience and I was getting all the feedback that my video sucked, you know, mm. until I, until it broke the dam. Interesting. And then the core audience came and then it blew up. See that, that and, you're right. And that, there was a delay there. You're, you're right that absolutely like, and, and I guess like what I don't want my, my like hot take to represent is like, don't endure in something that you feel intuitive about that. You're like, no, I think this is actually going to hit. It's, it's this sort of artistic resentment towards the masses who don't get what you're doing that to me is like the wrong-headed way to think about it. If you're like, no, I'm on to yeah. something. I just need to wait until it hits the right audience. Yeah. But I'm thinking about an audience. Like yeah. the work that we do, if we are communicating to an audience, the audience is king. Yeah. They are all that matters. We are not. What we – our artistic vision and whatever, like – it only works if it resonates with large yeah. amounts of people. And again, unless you're doing something for your friends and family or for yourself, go nuts, indulge, whatever. Yeah. But like if you are trying to appeal to a to a mass audience, you have to be thinking yeah. of them at all times. I think you saying, Oh, the world is a pro the problem is a thinly veiled way of saying I'm a victim. Yeah, 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 yeah. In in many ways. Yeah. And and I think the caveat, as you said, it's really important that it's not lost in the discussion is if you're clear that it's just, it's, it's artsy and you're doing it how you want and you don't care. Like you can let go of how it's received in the world. Then that's fine. It's a separate thing. But I get, but I get, I get that. Like, yeah. Yeah. I just, I think that oftentimes that kind of mentality is, is a, is a protection mechanism because yeah, putting stuff out to an audience and caring what they think, caring on even it, like what we talked about earlier about like, you don't, you shouldn't care too much. Like you shouldn't let it into your soul. But if you are someone who is out there trying to grow, put stuff out to a larger audience and grow an audience, then you have to care what they think. That yeah. is literally what you are doing. Yeah. And I think that it's easy to say like, no, I just don't care. Like I'm just going to do my thing. And I think a, a lot of the wrong headed advice that I roll my eyes at. That's actually like what most people say. So now this is the real, now we're getting to the real hot take at the core <laughs> of my package is more controversial. Just stick to your guns. Keep doing what you're doing. Uh, yeah. Be yourself. And, and uh, eventually it'll catch on yeah. like this. I hear this all the time. Yeah. Like if you, if you feel it in your gut, keep doing it. And it's like, no, that's not helpful advice. Now what they're saying, and there's good intentions around this is like, don't sell your soul. And just go with the whims of what's like the thing of the day, the trend of the day. I absolutely hear it in that way. But if it gets misconstrued as like, I have this idea, I'm going to stick to it. And I'm not going to pivot it based on like what I actually learn about what audiences want. Then you're just, you're setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. So that is, that is another little bit of advice. Man, I guess I do have some, I guess I do have more advice than I thought I did. That's great. No, I like that. Um, okay. I think that's, that's a, that's a good that's a good stopping point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, honestly. This is for, great. This was a really fun conversation. Yeah. I think you're an incredible human being. Thank you, man. The work that you're doing, the impact, and also your generosity in terms of, like, we're always actually having conversations like this. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. This is one of many. This is very natural. And I really value other people that want to intellectually spar. Yep. And get into the granular yeah, details yeah, of, like... Yeah. Why is that? Yes. You know? Yeah. And even recently, like you asking me about my views on spirituality. Mm, yeah, dude. That was rich. And it's like, okay, so you yep. left the church, but you're still exploring. It's yeah. A, it's a, oh, yeah. a forever exploration. It's a forever exploration. And that to me is th that posture in life 
is the exciting one. It's the exciting one to be voraciously curious all the time. And when I'm, I, I, if I'm not this curious when I'm 73, I'll be d- deeply disappointed yeah. in that. My, my current self will be disappointed. Yeah. You have to cultivate it. You do. And, and I, was, I wanted to say that. I think curiosity must be protected like a little flame. Mm-hmm. You have to take care of yourself because you can't just, you can't just force it out, you know? Yeah. Curiosity comes forth by itself, I find. Yeah. And it's not as much there when I'm tired or when I'm worn out yeah. or when I'm not taking care of myself, yeah, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, these types of conversations, I think, are enlivening and invigorating yeah. in that way. Cool, man. Cool, dude. This All is right. good. Thank this you. This is good. This was awesome. That was a conversation with the one and only Johnny Harris. I will leave links to his work in the description and show notes, as well as ways that you can support this podcast if you like it. Thank you for listening.